In part one of the unit two notes, we will be covering matter, physical versus chemical properties, and intensive versus extensive properties. First, a few key terms which you are hopefully already familiar with. Matter, any physical substance which possesses mass and occupies space. This is essentially anything that you can touch or manipulate in any way. Mass, a measure of the amount of matter in an object measured in grams. And weight, the force exerted on the mass of a body by a gravitational field. Students often mix up mass and weight. But weight is dependent on a gravitational force, so weight can change based on your location, whereas mass would remain constant. Volume, the amount of space that a subject occupies. So an example which brings all these terms together could be when Neil Armstrong left on his mission to the moon in 1969. He had a mass of 74.8 kilograms and a weight of 165 pounds. Since gravity on the moon is one-sixth of the gravity on Earth, Neil Armstrong weighed 27.5 pounds on the moon. His mass did not change since his body contained the same amount of matter in both locations. His volume was also constant. Here are sub several examples of things that would not meet the definition of matter. One example would be energy. You could also have sound, light, gravity, a vacuum, rainbows, heat, happiness, or the concept of time. In order to consider what happens to matter, you can think of it in terms of an equation. Composition plus structure equals behavior. The composition is what things are made of, the structure is how they're put together, and the behavior is what you end up with in the end. So if you consider the picture that we have here, all of the people or animals within this photo are composed of Lego blocks. Depending on what color block you have, what size, and how you put it together, which would be the structure, you end up with different behaviors. So you have a pack of dogs, you have a young boy holding the leash for the dogs, a father and mother with a camera, or a sister with a cell phone. Now the same concept could be applied to uh, chemistry in general with atoms. So here we consider two different structures and the composition for both of these structures is the same. Both are made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, but the structures are going to be different. So you're going to have a different amount of each of these three basic building blocks put together in a different pattern. Now you don't have to understand how to draw or even to interpret these specific types of diagrams. These are related to organic chemistry, but at the very least, you should be able to tell that they're different. In this picture for aspirin, we have this ring structure with these two uh, separate subgroups that are coming off of it. Whereas here for sucrose, which is a type of sugar, you have two separate rings, which are both connected by this oxygen in the middle. So the fact that these have the same exact elements in it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to behave in the same exact way or be used for the same thing. Because the structure is different, one is going to end up being a painkiller, whereas the other is going to be a sweetener. So if you change either the composition or the structure, you could end up with a different behavior. The next thing we're going to be covering is physical versus chemical properties. A physical property is a characteristic of a substance that can be observed or measured without changing the sample's composition. And here I have a whole bunch of different examples of things that would be physical properties. First, conductivity. For this, we could be talking about either heat or electricity. You have malleability, which is the ability of a substance to be easily bent or shaped. The size, shape, or texture of an object would all be examples of physical properties. Uh, color, odor, hardness, and luster. So luster is a term that you might not be familiar with. It's essentially a scientific word for shining. So this would be a property that a metal like aluminum would have. Viscosity, which is related to how easily a substance can be poured. So we're talking about liquids with that. Melting and boiling point, is referring to the temperature at which those 
phase transitions would occur. So what temperature does an object melt at and what temperature does it boil at? Solubility, the ability of a substance to dissolve within a solution. Our mass, volume, density, and finally phase of matter. And this one is very important because students often get confused with this because the substance looks different in the end. So if you consider uh, H2O as our chemical compound, you can have a solid, which would be ice, a liquid, which would be liquid water, and then a gas, which would be steam. Now, while this uh, water is going to look different in each of those phases of matter, every single time the chemical formula is H2O. So since it is still the same exact composition, it's going to be a physical property which of these states that it happens to be in. And by relation to that, a physical change when it goes through each of those transitions. Next up, we have chemical properties. Chemical properties describe the ability of a substance to undergo a specific chemical change. And these can only be observed as the substance is being changed chemically. So a few examples of that. Reactivity, the tendency of a substance to undergo a chemical reaction. Some chemicals are extremely stable, and they're not going to really change in any way if you let them sit out. Other chemicals could be potentially photosensitive, so maybe they break down in the presence of light. Uh, that's also related to chemical stability, so the resistance of a chemical to change in a chemical reaction. Next up, heat of combustion. That is the heat given off when one mole of substance is burnt in oxygen. Enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of a compound forms. Flammability, the ability of a chemical to burn or ignite. Oxidation number, the number of electrons transferred to form an ion. Stability, the tendency of a material to resist change or decomposition. And finally, toxicity, the degree to which a chemical can co cause damage to an organism. So all of these are examples of chemical properties which you would only be able to observe during the actual changing process. All right, our final concept for today is going to be intensive versus extensive properties. An intensive property is a property which is independent of the amount of substance which is present. If a property would not change if you were to cut an object in half, it is an intensive property. And this idea here at the bottom is really how you're going to be determining whether a property is intensive or not. So for example, let's say that we have a blue piece of construction paper. If I were to tear that blue paper in half, both halves would still be blue. So that means that the color is independent of the amount of paper that I have. Other examples of intensive properties could be the smell, ductility, which is the ability to be of a metal to be drawn out into a wire, the phase of matter, so whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, malleability, boiling point, melting point, and density. So for a boiling point and melting point, if we're talking about the Celsius scale, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Water melts at zero degrees Celsius. It doesn't matter how much water we have in either of those two scenarios. The temperature at which those phase transitions occur is a constant. So again, that shows that it doesn't matter how much of the water we have in those examples. So intensive properties. Uh, density is another good example, which we will get to on the next slide. We're gonna go into that one in a little more detail. Uh, extensive property. This is a physical property which is dependent on the amount of substance present. If a property would change if you were to cut an object in half, it is an extensive property. So let's think back to that blue piece of construction paper again. If I tear that paper in half, each of those two halves is going to have half of the size that it was before. Uh, maybe I'm measuring it in terms of length, which would also change or the mass. I would have half as much mass in either of those pieces of paper as opposed to the original when it was whole. Uh, the shape could also potentially change, or the volume. 
Now I mentioned that we would get back to density. So for our checkpoint question here, we are going to prove that density is an intensive property. And remember, for all checkpoint questions, you should be writing out the solutions to these in a notebook. Now the equation for density is D equals M over V. So let's say that we have a hypothetical substance which has a mass of five grams and a volume of five milliliters, just to keep the numbers simple. Now, if I were to plug this into my density equation, I don't have to move any of the letters around. Everything's solved for. So I have five grams over five milliliters. And of course, five over five is going to be equal to one. So one gram per milliliter. Now let's say that I take this theoretical substance and I cut it in half. If I cut the object in half, my new mass is going to be half as much, so we'll call it 2.5. And my new volume is also going to be half as much, 2.5 milliliters. Now if I plug that into the same density equation, 2.5 grams over 2.5 milliliters, 2.5 over 2.5 is still one gram per milliliter. So even though I have cut the object in half and the mass and volume are changing, because both of those uh, variables are present within the equation, the density is constant. So it's not going to change when you cut an object in half. So this is a way that you could either prove to yourself or potentially prove on a test or a quiz that density is an intensive property. That concludes part one of the unit two notes. When we come back for part two, we're going to be looking at physical versus chemical changes.